Hello and welcome to State of Events, San Francisco State's very own public newscast. I'm Michael Overby, and I'm honored to be working alongside my colleague, Victor Anguiano. How you doing, Victor? I'm doing well, man. Just just getting used to this uh, spring forward. Uh, yeah, this time change has yeah, my body clock all messed up. But yeah, let's get but, to the news. What do you have to say today? Yeah, so it was almost two years later, a jury has reached a verdict in the Alex Nieto versus SFPD case. Nieto was shot and killed by four from San Francisco police officers back in 2014. Trey Burgos is live in the Mission District where friends and family gathered to celebrate the victim's life. Jerry? Thanks, guys. I'm standing right outside of the CCSF Mission Campus where family and friends gather to celebrate the life of Alex Nieto. A lot of people were here, were upset over the verdict results that the jurors decided not to indict the uh, four officers, SFPD officers that shot Alex Nieto 59 times. Um, we talked to some of his family and friends, a lot of them sad and upset. Others were just happy to be able to celebrate the life of Alex Nieto. Guys, emotions were running very high here tonight in the celebration of life of Alex Nieto. Some folks upset and sad over the verdict results. Others happy to be able to get together and celebrate the life of the young Hispanic male. For you, for a celebration of life. That's what Alex Nieto's family called the gathering here tonight. A jury found the three officers that shot 28-year-old Alex Nieto 59 times not guilty of using excessive force. Nieto's longtime neighbor, Denise Doni, expressed her sadness in regards to the verdict decision. It's a shame. It's a shame for the society. It's a shame for our kids, for the future generations that see that when you have a badge, you can do whatever you want and you don't get punished. Nieto was accused of pointing a taser gun at officers who reported to the call of a man with a weapon at Berno Heights Park. And Mr. Nieto pulled that trigger while he was right in front of these police officers and that he pulled it while it was pointed at the police officers. The way the wires went out of the taser, the way the taser was found. Nieto's lawyers claim it's a sad day for the community. Nothing that the Nieto's deserve, much less that the community of San Francisco deserves. You know, it's a sad day for my clients in the Nieto's, but it's an even worse day for the city of San Francisco. I talked to some of his closest friends and family, and they told me they are now looking to join forces with the Mario Woods Coalition. Mario Woods, to remind some folks, was an African-American male that was shot and killed by the San Francisco Police Department a couple months back. That's all we got here from San Francisco, live in the Mission District. Jerry Burgos, State of Advance. Thanks, Jerry. Hope it's not too hot out there. I know this weather is pretty unpredictable today. Controversy in San Francisco today as another fire erupted from a building that was previously damaged in a fatal four-alarm fire earlier this year. Late Sunday night in the Mission District of San Francisco, a three-alarm fire broke out. The fire in the building on 22nd Street. Reports came in just before 11.30 p.m. and was under control within an hour, fire officials say. No one was injured, but the cause of the blaze is still under investigation. The blazes sparked further arson fears from the community. People want and have wanted the owner to take action to either rebuild or sell the decaying building. Three former San Jose State University students were sentenced to probation and community service yesterday for misdemeanor battery charges against their roommate, whose neck they forced into a bike lock in 2013. Officials say three men, who are white, put a bike lock around William's neck, who is black, and trapped him in a bathroom while hanging a Confederate flag over the door, amongst other things. Misdemeanor hate crime charges were brought against the trio previously, but those charges were dropped last month. They will now serve two, probation, or two years of probation and 30 days in jail. A day after the Cal Bears were named to participate in the men's NCAA basketball tournament, assistant head coach Jan Huffnagel was fired following a sexual harassment investigation. The decision comes a month after Huffnagel was under investigation by the university. Yesterday, the program received its highest seed in school history, but now it's playing a backseat due to the investigation. According to multiple reports, the allegations came from a female reporter. University officials say once the result of the investigation was made clear, they took action and fired the Cornell alum, effective immediately 
Hours after being fired, the former Cal Bears coach told ESPN he was blindsided by the news and offered this response on Twitter. Right now, the only focus should be on our basketball team. My time to exonerate myself of the fruitless claim by a reporter will come. No one on Cal will give details of the actual nature of the interaction, but the school has a strict sexual harassment policy. Hofnagel is in the process of hiring a legal team to cha challenge the investigation's findings. It seems sexual harassment investigations at UC Berkeley have become a common issue for the university. Three other faculty members have been fired following sexual harassment investigations. Last week, former dean of Berkeley's law school, Sujit Kohudri, resigned after his exe ex executive assistant sued him for kissing and touching her multiple times in October of 2015. Astronomer professor Jeff Marcy was accused of harassing four students. The university gave him a warning, but Marcy resigned after the investigation was made public. And lastly, Vice Chancellor of Research Graham Fleming stepped down after former assistant vice chancellor reported him to the university. According to her, Fleming touched her inappropriately and sent her affectionate emails. In other news, today is Super Tuesday 3. Let's check in with our political consultant Haley Vetterline so she can tell us what to expect going into today's primaries. Thank you. And as Michael said, it's Super Tuesday 3, and it is going to be a crucial night in the 2016 presidential race. Five states have their Republican and Democratic primaries today. Those states include Florida, Illinois, Missouri, North Carolina, and Ohio. It looks as if Clinton is going to finish her sweep of the South by picking up wins in Florida and North Carolina. Clinton's lead in Florida appears secure as she is ahead of Sanders 60 to 34 percent in the Sunshine State. Ohio is a much closer race where Sanders trails Clinton by only five points at 46 to 51 percent. For the Republicans, Florida and Ohio are raising the stakes since they are winner-take-all states. New polls that were released ahead of today's primaries found Donald Trump on a track to deliver a knockout blow to Florida Senator Marco Rubio in his home state. Trump has a very wide lead. He tops Rubio 46 to 22 percent. On the other hand, Trump is tied with Ohio Governor John Kasich on his turf at 33 percent each. These primaries are following a weekend full of commotion. There were animated protests at Trump rallies, some of which turned violent, and a Democratic town hall where Clinton and Sanders accused Trump of political arson. Make sure to tune in next week when the Republicans and Democrats take on Arizona and Utah on Super Tuesday 4. Back to you. Coming up, BART is bringing a new look to the trains. Tell you more about it when we come back. Plus, we'll tell you how, what happened to Moraga this past weekend, and it has to do with the, the El Nino storms. Welcome back to State of Events. For BART riders, the fleet of the future cannot come soon enough. Yesterday, BART released video of its first brand new train car making its way to the Bay Area. The train cars are being made in Plattsburgh, New York. The first car is now being sent to a BART testing facility in Hayward. If testing goes smoothly, this 10-car train could be used by actual BART passengers by December of this year. In total, nearly 800 new train cars will be integrated into the system by 2021. BART is still hoping more funding will allow it to manufacture even more new train cars. It's a system that is currently bursting at the seams as ridership soars. Oakland iconic downtown waterfront Jack London Square has been uh, sold to CIM Group, two previous owners were a commercial re realty firm Ellis Partners, Transbay Holdings and Difco West. According to the newest owners of the deal, uh, they will have Landmarks restaurants, the landmarks are the restaurant, retail stores, and office complexes. The CIM group will own about 6,000 square feet plus 665 residential units that are still under development. For the former management group, they were proud of being part of uh, Jacktown London Square uh, for the past 14 years. The CIM group believes the ownership will continue to improve and maximize Jack London Square for the city of Oakland. This past week in the Bay Area was hit by El Nino. Many regions in the Bay Area were affected, especially Moraga. 
The city was hit by heavy rains and winds causing it to open a sinkhole leading to a gas leak and about 450 citizens were forced to evacuate their homes. PG&E says the gas leak was merely caused by a light, that, a light pole that fell into the sinkhole causing it to puncture the gas line. The residents living in Center and Rahim were affected by the gas leak about 2.30 p.m. on Sunday. About 2,500 of those citizens were left without gas. According to PG&E, the, they are in process of restoring all of the gas outages. There's no estimated time when the electric company will finish, but the company encourages its customers to call the main line if they have any questions. The marijuana business is blazing. In its annual report on the U.S. cannabis industry, Marijuana Business Daily, an online publication for professionals in the marijuana industry, predicts up to a $44 billion economic impact by 2020. To put that into some corporate context, it's roughly the equivalent of current market cap of the television streaming service Netflix or Caterpillar Construction. Last year's report predicted $14 billion to $17 billion in impact for 2016. The publication has been producing the report since 2012. Now let's check in with Kasha to see what's going on around the world. She has the latest updates on a developing story from Belgium. Thanks, Michael. That's right. Today we're starting with breaking news from Belgium. The Belgian capital, Brussels, is on lockdown. French and Belgian police forces are hunting for at least two men linked to last year's terrorist attacks in Paris. Shots were fired at police while they were conducting a counter-terrorism raid in Brussels. According to the federal prosecutor's spokesman, the raid is part of an ongoing Paris attacks investigation. 130 people were killed last November in the deadly attacks for which ISIS, the Islamic State militant group, claimed responsibility. Russia says it will continue airstrikes in Syria, despite of the recent withdrawal of most of its forces. Earlier this week, United Nations welcomed Russia's decision to pull its forces out of Syria when Russian President Vladimir Putin announced that his country would no longer conduct any airstrikes. As the announced withdrawal started, more Russian airstrikes were reported near the city of Palmyra. The city has been held hostage by terrorists from the Islamic State since last May. Political protests in Venezuela continue. Venezuela's opposition is launching a new campaign to oust current president, Nicolas Maduro. Thousands of people marched in Caracas and other cities across the country amid Venezuela's deep economic crisis. The opposition has formed a new coalition called the Democratic Unity Roundtable to force Maduro out of the office. The country's political instability reached its peak when Hugo Chavez, Venezuela's president of 14 years, died in 2013. Michael, back to you in the studio. Coming up after the break, we'll tell you about the new assisted suicide law and Victor as a powerful story on a Redwood City local who overcame the odds and reclaimed his life. Welcome back to State of Events. Almost half of the people who die at the hands of police have some kind of disability. According to a new report, as officers, officers are often drawn into emergencies where urgent care may be more appropriate than lethal force. The report, published by the Ruderman Family Foundation, a disability organization, proposes that while police interactions with minorities draw increasing scrutiny, disability and health considerations are still neglected in media coverage and law enforcement policy. Governor Jerry Brown is now allowing adults over the age of 18 to ask doctors to terminate their lives if they have six or less months to live. The End of the Life Option Act will be in full effect June 9th. According to the law, doctors would prescribe the appropriate medication to speed up the person's death. But in order for the sick patient to practice the law legally, two doctors must prescribe the medication. They'll be able to begin the procedure by themselves by simply swallowing a pill but it must be declared in writing 48 hours before taking the pill. This will be the fifth state in the U.S. allowing, to, allowing patients to practice medical suicides. California joins Vermont, Oregon, Washington, and Montana. 
The U.S. politician community believes it's a historic day for California and it will help patients to not having a painful death. Victor Anguiano has an interesting story about a Redwood City local that defied all odds and has recovered from an autoimmune disease. Victor, can you tell us a little bit more about this man? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an, a person I've known for a, a very long time, but uh, in recent years, we've seen that our healthcare system has improved, but there are still many loopholes. Uh, this is a story about a former team manager, like I was saying, former team manager that he was a mentor for a youth soccer uh, team in Redwood City called Juventus Soccer Club. And uh, he struggled a lot. He had a very rare disease. And uh, the, what, what you're about to see is about how he overcame this and uh, what, what he's doing with his life now. This family has been through a lot, Frank. Uh, he's still not completely recovered, but he's doing a lot better. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting story. And uh, it's, it's great that he's doing really well now. It seems so. What are the most common symptoms of this disorder? Uh, um, I mean, Frank's case was a little bit to the extreme, um, mm -hmm. but usually you feel muscle weakness. Um, you have problems swallowing and uh, you, you're losing weight. Uh, unconsciously it's just because of the illness and how bad it is um, that's so those are three of the the main symptoms you have when the, you have dermal myositis as the number of Zika cases in the Bay Area and around the world rise Bay Area doctors gathered at UCSF for a day-long symposium that focused on both basic research and prevention state of events correspondent Michelle Gong has the details the growing Zika crisis increasingly worries more and more across the nation the virus can be transmitted from mother to unborn child and is linked to birth defects such as microcephaly. UCSF professor Kirsten Salmin says that pregnant women are the most vulnerable because detection is difficult and may come too late. So Zika virus sort of presents a pregnant woman's worst uh, possible nightmare. She might not know if she was infected. She might not be able to avoid infection. And if there is an impact on her fetus, it might not be diagnosed until the late third trimester. So needless to say, pregnant women across the world are terrified of this disease. Health officials have asked Congress to provide about $2 billion to help fight the virus and help further prevent it from spreading to the continental U.S. Doctors say that Zika is widespread in the Caribbean and Latin America, where mosquitoes are prevalent. UCSF professor Michael Bush says that blood transfusions are being imported from low-risk areas to regions where Zika is pandemic. As of today, this HHS, Health and Human Services, has announced that all blood in Puerto Rico is being imported from the United States continental U.S. until we can implement testing, hopefully over the next several months. There have been five confirmed cases in the Bay Area, but doctors say that residents don't need to worry unless they are traveling. Now, as doctors gather here at UCSF to highlight the effects of Zika and to discuss the importance of more research, they say that the risk of transmission here in the U.S., and especially in the Bay Area, is very low. Doctors still say that the best way to avoid contracting Zika is to avoid places where the virus is being heavily transmitted. Reporting live from UCSF, Michelle Gong, State of Events. Coming up next, we have our breakdown of This Week in Sports, your weekly weather forecast, and an editorial on California's controversial bullet train by our very own Ace Prado. See you after the break. Hello and welcome back to State of Events. In our newscast last week, our reporter Anton Luchtel discussed the issue of paying college athletes. Here he is again with an in-depth look on the debate. He's at the five. Dives over the I find it unconstitutional. And so still on his feet. Touchdown, Aggies. They are hungry nights that, uh, that I go to bed and uh, I'm starving. The NCAA is an organization that governs college athletes. They rake in close to a billion dollars per year. The only problem? The athletes that actually generate the revenue get nothing. NCAA President Mark Emmert feels if the players receive compensation, then it is no longer college sports. There's a lot of people who think that if a football team generates a lot of cash, that the student athletes ought to share in that. I mean, if you're going to make it professional sport, make it professional sport. 
On the other hand, pundits make the argument, if the entire NCAA is run as a professional sport, then why can't the players be compensated as well? Now, this isn't high school sports where we're having bake sales and jogathons and charging $5 for admission. Uh, this is a multi-billion dollar business that is professional in every way except how the athlete is allowed to be compensated. A core argument against paying college athletes is that they are an academic scholarship. Well, it should be noted that once your playing career is over, so is your scholarship. And also that graduation rates for Division I basketball and football players is around 50%. And these institutions say they prioritize the student and student athlete. And I agree with much of the argument that student athletes need scholarships that provide greater support, that they need uh, better commitment and guarantees on their scholarships when they finish up with athletics. So if Emmert agrees not enough is being done to help the athlete post-athletics, then why hasn't anything changed? The members, which are all the schools that are in the NCAA, drive the conversation, and he, as the president, reacts to the membership or comes up with strategic ideas on how to persuade the membership to get on board. And that's a great example of what we should be doing is making sure that our student athletes can graduate. All of these issues came to a boiling point when former UCLA star Ed O'Bannon filed the lawsuit against the NCAA claiming athletes deserve revenue generated off their images. Two months later, Judge Claudia Wilkin ruled in favor of O'Bannon permitting colleges to pay athletes up to $5,000 per year. The NCAA has since appealed the ruling. Next stop, the Supreme Court. This is Anton Lucktell in San Francisco, State of Events. The NFL's top health and safety officer, Jeff Miller, acknowledged Monday there is indeed a link between football-related head trauma, more specifically chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, the first time a senior league official has conceded football's connection to the devastating brain disease. The admission came during a discussion on concussions convened by the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce. Jeff Miller was asked by Representative Jan Schakowsky if the link between football and neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases like CTE has been established. The answer to that question is certainly yes, Miller said. Well, yesterday it was this guy's birthday right here. He just turned 28. And I'll let you in a little secret. I don't think the MVP is slowing down anytime soon. Please roll the tape. In the first quarter, this birthday boy, he shakes and bakes all the way to the hole and gets the two on a nifty uh, left finish. Curry finished in that 27 with five rebounds and five assists in the second quarter. Clayton Thompson does the same with a jumper over Anthony Davis. Hey, but Steph was like, I want some action too. Give me some Davis action. And the MVP crosses him over and gets the end one at the half. The Warriors were uh, up by 11 points in the third quarter. The Warriors were just having some fun. Andrew Bogut with, uh, with the three. Yes, Andrew Bogut made that three. The guy is shocked and amazed that he actually made that in. But guess who wraps it up? It's obviously Steph Curry with the corner triple. The Warriors win. 127-107, they get their 60th win of the season and remain undefeated at home with a 31-0 uh, record this season. And the 16, the 16 and 6 dubs just need one win, uh, sorry, they need to win 13 of the last 16 games to beat the 95-96 Bulls record of 72 and 10. And as for uh, March Madness, it's, it's coming this Thursday. And uh, Cal, uh, they took the fourth seed of the south part of the bracket. As we mentioned earlier, the 23 and 10 Bears took their highest seed in the program's history. They will face Hawaii in the first round of the of the tournament in uh, Spokane, Washington, on Friday at two in the afternoon. It's going to be a good tournament for them, and we can only expect them to to make it far this year. And as for uh, but as for the Gales, obviously they didn't get the they, they didn't get the the bid to make it the tournament. They were snubbed. St. Mary finished 27-5 and five according to the committee. They lost some important games against, uh, against Cal, Pepperdine. And the, uh, so the Gales, uh, th they weren't too happy, but Coach uh, Randy uh, Barnett knows the team uh, is okay. And here's what he had to say about the team not making the tournament. And if you are a Gale fan, it will, it's going to be tough to watch the tournament this year, but it's going to be even more harder for the for the fans, the Gale fans, the Stanford fans, because uh, Stanford fired uh, his basketball head coach, Johnny uh, Dawkins, after finishing the, the year 15 and 15. Uh, he was in charge of the programs for the last eight season and had an overall record of 156 to 115. Under the, uh, under the former Blue Devil, the teams reached 
the Sweet 16s in 2013 2014 season. It was the farthest Dawkins was able to lead the Cardinals in the NCAA tournament. And let's finish up with some Quakes action. Juan Delaskin, the Quakes, taking the defending MLS champs, the Portland Timbers, at Avaya Stadium last Sunday. They were both entered in the game undefeated. Let's go to the actions in the first, first half. Off a low cross, Chris Wondolowski doing Wando things. Gives the Quakes the lead 1-0. Wondolowski scores his 11, 111th goal. Ranks fifth among MLS all-time scorers. Landon Dowdham is in first with 40, 144. But Quincy, uh, Quincy Ameriqua had things to say about himself too. With uh, the Bakersfield native with a beautiful shot. Puts, the, puts it in the net and... Uh, if we can get a replay on that, please, because that's an amazing goal what this guy just did. Uh, and yeah, but next Saturday, the Quakes will be uh, at the LA Galaxy for the first California Clasico of the season. Michael, uh, that, should be a, that should be a good game. Uh, we'll see what happens then. Sounds like a pretty big week in sports. Yeah. <laughs> the Obama administration took a big step towards reducing climate change today. We go to Maya Church correspondent Maya Church for details on this decision and this week's weather forecast. The Obama administration announced today they will not open the Atlantic coast up for oil and gas exploration. This is considered a big win for environmental groups, local communities, fishermen, and the Pentagon, which believed naval bases were at risk. Interior Secretary Sally Jewell said this morning, when you factor in conflicts with national defense, economic activities such as fishing and tourism, and opposition from many local communities, it simply doesn't make sense to move forward with any lease sales in the coming five years. This announcement aligns with the president's recent efforts to combat climate change. And now for our weather. For the next few days, we can expect the weather to be fairly warm within temperatures in the low to mid 70s. On Friday, the clouds will start to roll in, but there is no chance of rain. For people who like to exercise outside, I recommend doing it during the week because over the weekend we may see some light showers, but nothing like the El Nino storms from last week. Until next time, San Francisco, stay dry. California's bullet trade project is in serious financial crisis. Many residents throughout the state are filing lawsuits, so the court is postponing the start of this project. Ace Prado is here to share his thoughts. This project is a mess from the beginning. The original cost to build the train is approximately $33 billion and the number gone up to eight, $68 billion. It becomes more complicated. First, the money was approved by a stimulus bill in 2009. Next, the state legislative approved the high-speed rail line. Federal taxpayers spent approximately $4 billion on the train. Now they are stuck. Many people have been filing lawsuits due to environmental concerns. Experts say in California made the worst decision because $6 billion can fix California's roads, bridges, and infrastructure. In the East Coast, Maryland decided to build a bullet train that can travel between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore within 15 minutes. According to ABC7 in Washington, D.C., many people start to question reasons how the high-speed rail line can be ec economically successful. Is it a waste of time or BS to make everyone happy? If you're a Walking Dead fan, then this is good news for you. The Walking Dead will have its own attraction at Universal Studios this summer. During Sunday's show of Talking Dead, they announced Universal Studios would be a full-time attraction after having it as a part-time gig during the Halloween season. The amusement park has decided to offer it 365 days a year. Children under 13 will not be able to walk through the maze, however. The attraction will be bigger and have better zombies, costumes, and props. So I think we got to take a trip to uh, SoCal to see what's it do. about. Yeah, I think we do. Yeah, it was a great, great, uh, great uh, working with you today. And, of course. Uh, meet us next week here at State of Events uh, to get the, the latest news.